So it's now my pleasure to introduce our afternoon's keynote speaker, Commissioner Helen Milroy. Uh, Commissioner Milroy is a consultant child and adolescent psychiatrist and Winthrop professor at the University of Western Australia. Uh, she's been on state and national mental health advisory committees and boards with a particular focus on the well-being of children. Uh, Commissioner Milroy is a descendant of the Palaku people of the Pil Pilbara region of Western Australia and she was born and educated here in Perth. She studied medicine at the University of Western Australia and worked as a GP and consultant in childhood sexual abuse at the Princess Margaret Hospital for Children for several years before completing specialist training in child and adolescent psychiatry. Uh, Commissioner Milroy's work and research instance, uh, in interests include holistic medicine, uh, child mental health, uh, recovery from trauma and grief, uh, application of Indigenous knowledge, uh, cultural models of care, Aboriginal health and mental health, and developing and supporting the Aboriginal medical workforce. Uh, she's currently appointed as a commissioner on Australia's Royal Commission into, into, into Institutional Child Sexual Abuse, and her address today is entitled, Supporting Survivors of Institutional Child Sexual Abuse, Learnings from the Royal Commission. Please join me in welcoming Helen Milroy. Thank you so much for inviting me to come today. Um, it's really lovely to be back in my home state. Unfortunately, since I've been working with the Commissioner, hard to get back to Perth. So please feel free to invite the Commission back to Perth for, for conferences. I'd be more than happy to come. Uh, just a few um, acknowledgements. This is a beautiful conference centre that we have here, and it's a beautiful part of Perth. So I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land in which we meet, the uh, Wajak Noongar people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. And there's nothing nicer than going out into that uh, foyer out there and just looking over at the Swan River and just realising what beautiful country this is and reminding ourselves that there's many, many, many thousands of years of Indigenous history right, uh, right, right beneath our feet. I'd also like to acknowledge... Um, now, I'm not going to get any of these names right, but I'll have a go. Mahashini Krishna, Chair of the Victim Support Australia and New South Wales Commissioner of Victim Rights. Uh, Dr Adam Thomason, Director of the Australian Institute of Criminology. Dr Anne O'Neill, uh, Chairperson and Founder of Angel, Angel Hands. Dr Mark Gronhuten, President of the World Society of Victimology. And Cheryl Gwilliam, Director General, Department of the Attorney General. Okay. Just by way of my own introduction, um, oh, just before I, I move on, that painting on the, on the first slide is about the importance of children and the importance of attachment and understanding that really bringing up children in this country is everybody's business. This is a, a, a part of my country, um, which is up in the Pilbara. That's my grandmother's country. It's the cultural group from which I'm from. And it's important that we as a nation are reflected within our own landscape and particularly as Indigenous people. This is my grandmother holding my mother and this is me holding my first child and it's really just a reminder of um, what the Royal Commission is really doing is highlighting the importance of children and I think as a society we need a cultural shift in understanding how we view and see children. I think in years gone past children were seen much more as a commodity to be dealt with as people saw fit and in a way that left children very vulnerable and open to abuse, in the, particularly in the large uh, institutions we had. But at the end of the day, um, our children will grow up and they will become the parents of the next generation. And unless we break those generational cycles of trauma and abuse, we won't get those healthy children who will eventually lead our nation forward. So this is just a reminder that we all come with generations behind us. And as my grandmother held my mother, my mother held me and I hold my children. And I hope that that continues on in a positive way. Uh, and that's X marks the spot just for those people who are from overseas. Um, this is an Aboriginal map of Australia and uh, Pelka country is where the X is. Okay, so let's get on to talking about uh, what we're here to talk about today and that's the, the Royal Commission. I was really... Um, I felt incredibly humbled and privileged to be appointed to the Royal Commission. I've worked in the area of child trauma and um, families for a long time, and to be able to be given this opportunity to do something significant in this area, um, as I said, really was a privilege. Um, <clears throat> I think we're all here today in some capacity to improve the lives of victims through promoting justice, reducing crime, and reforming our systems of care. 
Um, I think for, for all of us here, uh, I think it takes a lot of dedication to, to stay in this particular area of work and you know, I just thank all of you for being here today and taking the time to come and listen. Um, I'm one of six commissioners appointed to the Australia's Royal Commission. We were appointed in, in 2013 in response to the growing and significant community support for one of the nation's deepest failures and that was our um, failure really to protect Australia's children within our institutions. Our terms of reference are broad, um, and with that uh, we have an unprecedented power to inquire into institutions. While previous inquiries I think have looked at child abuse in specific institutions, until this Royal Commission began we did not know the full extent of what was happening, the full range of responses that had occurred, uh, nor the effectiveness of the support or, or, or services that we provided for people. Um, I think this Commission really marks a turning point in our history. And I also think that if you look at the international arena, there's really something happening internationally as well that supports this movement towards finally lifting the lid on these issues. And I think child sexual abuse in particular is one of the biggest taboos that we have in society. It's one of the most difficult things to talk about and to deal with. And it's, it's, it's finally come after a lot of advocacy and a lot of effort by a lot of people over many years to finally do something about this. For the first time, we can, we can look at multiple organisations in an effort to find out what happened and to develop effective responses. So our purpose is to bear witness, to have a just response for victims and survivors, and to create a safer future. Just in terms of the commissioners, we have six commissioners appointed. We have two judges, Justice McClellan from the Supreme Court in New South Wales, Justice Coate, who was the State Coroner in Victoria, Robert Fitzgerald, who was on the Productivity Commission and previously the Deputy Ombudsman in New South Wales, Bob Atkinson, who was a Police Commissioner from Queensland, Andrew Murray and myself, both from WA. Andrew was a previous Democrat Senator for many years and did lots of inquiries into um, forgotten Australians uh, and children in care, and myself as a psychiatrist. I don't think they knew what they were doing when they put a clinician on the commission, but anyway, I thought that was pretty good. So in terms of our work, um, well, just, I'll just sort of finish on something else there. In terms of our um, terms of reference, although we have some limitations, we actually have a very broad range of institutions we can inquire into. So basically, it's wherever there are children in some sort of care arrangement. Um, and unfortunately, where there are children, there's the potential for exploitation and abuse. And although that may be a terrible way to think about children, if you don't think about the potential for abuse, then you won't think about what you, got, what you have to do to, pre to prevent it or to identify it or to intervene early. Okay, so the three pillars of our work, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these, but I'm going to focus mostly on the private sessions today. The three pillars of our work are the private sessions, and we've had to have special legislation to provide for individual commissioners to sit with people to hear their stories. We also have a large um, uh, program of public hearings. Have some of you listened to some of the public hearings? Heard some of them on the news or been reported on? We've looked at a number of institutions already, and I'll go through a few of those. And then the third pillar, of course, is our policy and research, which is quite extensive. And in particular, we have a large criminal justice um, project, which I'll also talk about. So firstly, the private sessions. So the private sessions are primarily to bear witness. Um, we've seen nearly 4,000 people so far. We'll probably have seen 10,000, maybe, by the end of the commission. And that's really only scratching the surface. And we also have to remember that we're only dealing with victims from um, situations of institutional abuse. And we actually know that the vast majority of sexual abuse occurs within the family context. But still a significant body of work. I also believe that um, you know, child trauma is child trauma. And a lot of the recommendations we make around what we do in regard to child safety will have ramifications across the board for wherever child trauma actually occurs, whether it's within the family or within an institution. What's interesting about some of um, our statistics is that well over half are male, which is unusual because most surveys tend to look at females as the predominant group who are reporting sexual abuse. 
So although that's a sad statistic, uh, it still means that we're actually hearing from the voices of men, which I know um, for a lot of you who work in the area, men disclosing is a really difficult issue. Um, and so it's been really good for us to be able to examine that in more detail and understand what the experiences were like for men and also what led them to be able to come and disclose to us. You can see the age range there. So we, we are seeing predominantly the older age groups. However, we are seeing the full range of children. We are seeing uh, families where children have currently had experiences in out-of-home care or in other institutions where abuses occurred. And we're also seeing people who are very elderly. In fact, we've had some people in their 90s. And they've really had no one to talk to in their entire lifetime in terms of who are they going to tell. And so they finally felt that they've had some authority to be able to tell their story before their, their life comes to a conclusion. 43% of the complaints have been in, in out of some sort of out of home care environment. Where, uh, the larger institutions that we had in the past, particularly the large orphanages represent a lot of that, but we're also seeing contemporary cases in out of home care as well. 60% of the complaints have been coming from um, children who are in faith based organisations, so that's that's either the, the, the churches or the church-run organisations uh, in terms of out-of-home care. And of course, the predominant uh, offenders are male. In about um, half of the cases, some sort of penetration is involved, and in the rest of the cases, there's some other form of sexual abuse. On average, the abuse has lasted just under three years. And what we're also hearing in the private sessions is the differential vulnerability of children that come into these environments. So in the larger orphanages, there seemed to be a hierarchy of children who were seen as vulnerable or more amenable to abuse, perhaps. And so we would see a different treatment of those children in some of those uh, settings. For example, those children who really didn't have parents or any other sort of advocate were really much more vulnerable to the effects of abuse. And we're also um, hearing lots of stories, which, which is really quite disturbing, that it's often when there was an event that made the child or the family more vulnerable actually heralded the onset of some form of abuse. And I'll give you a, an example. So when a child experienced the death of a parent and there was some sort of seeking of, of refuge, perhaps, or support from other agencies or the church or the institution in which the child might have been placed for temporary care, then abuse occurred during that extremely vulnerable time for that child and that family. Which is also interesting because I think that when abuse occurs in that situation, then any change in the child's behaviour, which may have been evident, can easily be dismissed as being caused from something else, such as the death of a parent or a major family event. And so the, the onset of the abuse gets missed because it's being put down to something else. We're also hearing stories that seem to fall into two major categories, but then a whole continuum in between. So we're seeing those stories of abuse where children have had a very, um, a lot of grooming, there's a very seductive element to the abuse, and children in those sorts of circumstances often don't even know what it is. And particularly when the abuse was occurring at a young age, they don't even understand that it's abuse, or they may see it as normal. And so those children probably were less likely to disclose um, because it was sort of in a way less violent or less uh, difficult for the child to cope with and in a way the child learned to cope with it over time and became conditioned to it. We're also seeing the other extreme as well where there are stories of you know, sadistic violence basically against children and uh, I'm absolutely amazed at what some children have survived in our institutions and they're still uh, hopeful in their lives as adults. It's, it's truly quite inspiring. So we're seeing the full range in between as well. We've seen a lot of children who have gone from institution to institution and there's been a different abuser in, in each institution. And it's not uncommon um, when we've looked at some of the statistics around what we're seeing uh, that multiple abusers are, uh, are not uncommon. Although we don't have a full analysis of our private sessions yet, there will be a, a fuller report on that um, as time goes on and when we finish the full, uh, full amount of um, our sessions. So 
So the private sessions themselves, just for people who aren't exactly sure what we do, are really about um, hearing the stories from the personal perspective. It's a very free narrative approach. It's not interrogative. It's not evidence. It's information, but it's confidential information. When we set up the private sessions, we spent a lot of time engaging with the stakeholder groups and the various expert groups around the country. We wanted to have a trauma-informed care approach, which I'm sure is a word that gets bandied around a lot these days, but we tried to grapple with what that was and what that meant in terms of how we set up the sessions. We were very aware that previous inquiries, particularly around issues of trauma, may not have been as supportive to victims or survivors as they could have been. And we were also very aware that the staff um, that were conducting inquiries also experienced a high rate of burnout or vicarious traumatisation or other sorts of grief responses if they were constantly immersed in stories of abuse and trauma. So we did spend a lot of time in the first few months of the Commission in setting up our processes and trying to get them right. When we asked survivors where they would like to be interviewed, the only neutral place that we could come up with was a hotel because everything else had some kind of ramification or some kind of association with it. We couldn't have government offices, we couldn't have anything that labelled the rooms as, as the Royal Commission to protect confidentiality. We couldn't, we couldn't have uh, church-based organisations. So, so the only neutral place ended up being a hotel. So we've managed to get some very good partnerships with some of the hotels where we conduct the private sessions. Of course, hotels are very neutral. You can go into a hotel for any reason, no one knows why you're there. Um, and there's no signage or anything like that. The hotel staff have been trained to be very supportive and very confidential when a person approaches the front desk. They ring us and someone will come down and get the person. We also looked at what support services we would need to assist people coming to the private sessions. We try and accommodate people's needs as much as possible. We see them as our guest um, and we certainly see them as the expert in their own story. So we're not there to tell them anything or to to um, advise them about anything. We're just there to receive their story however they want to give it. They can have access to a counsellor beforehand if they need to. If they need to be linked into services before they come to us, that's also possible. And if there's a, a need for some kind of urgency, such as they have a chronic illness or there's other sorts of issues, then we will try and prioritise them as well. So although the person may only have about an hour to an hour and a half with the commissioner in the private session, They've often had several hours beforehand where people have rung them, they've talked them through issues, they might have been referred to counselling beforehand, then they have the time with us and then they have the debrief and the follow-up afterwards. So their actual journey through the Royal Commission is much more extensive than what it sounds in terms of them just coming to the private session. When they come into the private session, there'll be a commissioner, there'll be a commission officer who takes down some information. Everything's recorded directly onto our laptop uh, through some very um, high-tech audio audio recording equipment. And as I said, the session is very informal. Some people like to tell us every detail about their story, and that's absolutely fine. Other people bring us written information and want to talk about other matters. Some people just give us half the story and, and we sort of just go along with whatever they're happy with at the time. They can tell us their story however they like, in as much or as little detail as they're comfortable with. Generally speaking, people find the sessions really quite empowering. Uh, they often feel quite unburdened by the end of it, and uh, it's often been a very emotional journey with us through that time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. We've also tried to make um, available sessions in rural and remote places. Obviously, we'll fly people down to the sessions if, they, if they, we don't have a session available in their local area. We've also tried to do a lot of visiting um, and just so that no one's concerned about the photograph, that's not a real private session, of course, that's just part of our media campaign, just to show the informal and relaxed nature of the private sessions. The next pillar is our public hearings. I think we're up to about um, 28 now. Yep. So we've held public hearings in every state in Australia. We've looked into a diverse range of institutions, schools, children's homes, church-run organisations, out-of-home care. We looked at Swimming Australia. We looked at Scouts, the YMCA, Jewish centres, a yoga ashram. Uh, we've probably released, I think, we're up to about 11 or 12 of the case studies, which are all published now and available for people to read if they want to. Um, and they're all contained on our website as well. 
What's been interesting about the public hearings is that we've included always the victims' stories at the beginning, and that's a second level of empowerment for victims as well in being able to bear witness to their stories and for also them to be able to have a say within the public hearing. When victims or survivors give their stories in a public hearing, they're generally not cross-examined on the nature of the abuse or the actual story during their childhood. However, there may be cross-examination relating to some of the institutional response or criminal matters that may have proceeded thereafter. So I think as much as we could make it, given that it is a, a, a hearing and a court process, it's as safe as possible as we can make it for, for victims and survivors to give their stories in, in such a public way. And of course, they're live streamed on the internet, so people can watch or, or listen or can attend in person. Some of the information we've uncovered so far in the public hearings has been varied. We've also been um, able to look at not only just the responses of the institution where the child was in care, but also the responses of all of the other agencies associated with the disclosure. So we've looked at processes within DCP or child protection system. We've looked at matters of, the, of policing in regard to interviewing of, of witnesses and families, um, how that process then uh, goes forward into either a criminal prosecution or a, or a court hearing. And we've also then looked at uh, issues related to both civil litigation and some kind of other sorts of redress scheme that the uh, people may have been involved with. So they've been quite extensive. I think for the first time also, um, we've been able to look at the decision making by the, uh, the prosecuting bodies as well in the DPP, um, which was, a, a, I think, a new thing in regard to this sort of area. Some of the things we've been learning as well from the institutions, and in particular one that we did very early on, which involved a contemporary case in an out of school hours care environment for children, was that there were reasonable policies there were reasonable procedures in place, but nobody reported. Nobody reported the codes of conduct that were being breached. So unless we can have good policy and good procedures and a cultural shift in terms of actually reporting when you see things happening, we won't actually get there. What was also interesting was that when we looked at policies and procedures in general, most policies and procedures are pretty good but very few places have done an evaluation of whether they actually work in practice. And that's what we also need to do. So we've been able to identify a lot of gaps as well. In terms of the research, we've now published, I think, in excess of 13 research projects on our website. It's included research about sexual abuse prevention programs, effectiveness of screening practices, uh, we're about to publish our Working with Children's Check recommendations. We've got about another 48 research projects either underway um, or completed and uh, another 40 being scoped. We've had roundtables and consultations. We had a Working with Children's Check roundtable. We also had a roundtable or a public hearing technically on uh, redress and compensation. And we've held a lot of consultations with the advocacy and expert groups. Uh, to get the on-the-ground perspectives. We've had uh, our interim report was published last year, um, and that also contained, I think, about, around about 150 or so stories from the private sessions. And when we uh, publish our final volume, there will be a, a huge number of the stories again contained within the volume or as a separate volume, so that people can then understand the themes that emerge uh, from the material that we've been collecting. <clears throat> We've had a huge stakeholder engagement and public awareness campaign, and we've also looked at uh, trying to engage hard to reach groups. We have a specific um, program related to stakeholder engagement with the prisons, and in fact, we've been holding private sessions within the prison environment as well. They can be a bit challenging, but very interesting. Uh, in fact, they make up a very different group. In fact, what's been, I think, most interesting for me, particularly coming from a clinical background as a child psychiatrist, is that I was very used to seeing people more so at the sort of um, severe end of, of, uh, of disadvantage and distress. But what I'm seeing now with the Royal Commission is the full gamut of the population. We don't know where we're going to start off as children. We really don't. We, we don't know who, what family we're going to be born into. And we don't know where we're going to end up as adults. 
And I think what I've been exposed to with the Royal Commission is seeing people right throughout the whole um, community where these things have happened to them as children. Uh, so it's been, a, it's been an incredible experience so far. So in terms of the stakeholder engagement, we have a particular strategy around engaging people with disability. We did hold a disability-focused uh, public hearing uh, earlier on, on St Anne's School in, uh, in Adelaide that had specific issues around uh, children with disability and the difficulties in those sorts of children being able to disclose and also managing those sorts of behaviours. Um, we've got a, a remote strategy, we've got the prisoner strategy, we've also got a strategy around uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and also other uh, culturally and linguistically diverse communities. So we are getting a very broad group of people coming to the Commission. I think our um, campaign's been doing quite well. So I want to I move now into, so that's just really an overview of what we're doing. Now I, I want to now move into what we've been learning from some of the uh, private sessions. As I mentioned earlier, we're, we're up to nearly 4,000 sessions. And they only represent a small number of people coming forward. And they only represent those people coming forward who have said yes or made contact or had some sort of engagement and felt able to come forward. I would probably say that for every person that comes forward, they know of many others who either can't or won't or were forever, for whatever reason. We've also had a number of families come forward to represent the story of their um, family member who's died um, and some of those deaths of course have been from suicide which is a particular issue in this, uh, in this group of people. I just want to read a quote um, before we get into talking about some of the uh, impacts. So this, this is a story from one of the survivors who gave evidence in the recent public hearing in Ballarat, and I think he crystallises a lot of the issues around impact, and his name was Timothy Green. Um, and he'd been abused, uh, obviously, as a child in Ballarat, and this is, this is a quote from his transcript. Guilt and humiliation have always been my overriding emotions. Knowing about all the abuse that took place in Ballarat makes me feel totally ashamed and abjectly guilty. I have tried to cope with this all my life, but by the time I reached 40, it was beginning to consume me. I felt guilty about not doing more than, than, I, than what I did. I have heard through the media and police that there could have been as many as 40 to 50 suicides in Ballarat alone that were related to child sexual abuse. I don't have male friends. I get hypervigilant when males are around, and I'm not good with relationships. As a personal trainer, I train young guys, but I would not go out and socialise with them. When I used to go to, to a gym, I stood in the back corner and used to look around for potential threats. After about an hour of watching and realising there were no threats there, I could move on the gym floor. I don't feel comfortable about working in a male environment in the gym. I, used to, I, I use work to socialise and escape. If I don't, I wouldn't speak to anyone. I rarely go out. I can't go outside. I don't do any of the typical masculine things. It's almost as if I've taken every male tray in my life and gotten rid of it. I don't talk about cars or sport. If I had to go to the supermarket, I used to take my daughter with me. She was only seven or eight. She was a bit of security for me. She could tell me when I was going to have a panic attack and she would get me back to the house. If someone else take me out to a place I'm unfamiliar with, I can't cope and I can't talk to people. I don't like new situations or meeting new people. The abuse has affected my relationship with my ex-wife and my kids. I became so withdrawn I couldn't do anything. I can't go outside, I can't socialise. I think he actually, in just some of his story, highlights just the devastating and long-term impact that abuse can have on people's lives. And I don't think we as a society have fully understood. I think we had this stupid notion that children were resilient and would get over it. And we really didn't realise that the earlier a child is abused, in fact, probably the worst impact um, that it's going to have, and it's cumulative, and it's a multiplier over their life course. We often talk about the impact of sexual abuse in adults but the impact is across the lifespan. And every year it goes unmentioned, undisclosed or untreated, there's that cumulative effect taking place. So the impact is across all life domains. It's across families and it's across generations. Even in Timothy's story, the impact on his daughter having to be the parent and that reversal that you get um, because he was unable to cope and his daughter having to step in and play the role of parent is robbing that child of her childhood. In fact, um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the issue of parenting, and in particular this comes from the perspective of a lot of men that I've seen in private sessions. They have a double bind. 
One of the biggest fears that some of the men have is that they worry that if they tell anyone, then someone might think they could become an abuser. Now, although we know from the evidence that there are some pathways to becoming an offender through histories of child abuse, including sexual and physical abuse, we know that most people who are abused are not going to become offenders. However, the stigma that men feel is very strong and the shame aspect of that is very powerful. It does stop people from disclosing, but it also stops people from seeking any sort of help. So on the one hand, they want help to become a good dad. But if, if they disclose, they fear that someone's going to come and remove their children or look at them in a different way when they're parenting. Now, I've looked at this as an issue. There's not many parenting programs I can identify, in fact, I can't identify any, that are specifically for men with sexual trauma in how they parent children. I think it's an absolute gap in, uh, in our sort of understanding and services and information that we provide. And of course, if men can't speak up and get the help they need, then what actually happens is that they don't attach emotionally to their children or they're very distant or they're very hard on their kids because they want that distance there because of their own fear. So it becomes a really big issue in parenting. It's a similar issue for women, but I think that there are more services for women and there are generally more issues around um, you know, infant sort of mental health and attachment services that are specifically for women in regard to these sorts of issues, but there's a real lack for men. The other thing that uh, comes across very strongly in the stories that we're hearing is that just about, I'd say the majority of the people that we've been hearing from say that when the abuse started to happen, they changed. There was some change. Now, for a lot of those kids, no one noticed. Sometimes kids had uh, suffered a serious assault and gone home in a complete state of distress and shock or at school, or at an orphanage, and no one noticed. I know that's hard to believe, but that's certainly the stories we've been hearing. Sometimes if someone did notice or someone did ask, the child was either unable to disclose or tell the full extent of what happened, or it was put down to other issues, such as I mentioned earlier, um, the death of a parent or some other event that had happened in the life of the family. But it seems that we failed dismally in our systems of care to notice that something had happened to the child. And particularly for boys with aggressive acting out behaviour and for, for girls perhaps becoming more withdrawn, those changes in behaviour which heralded that something was going on just weren't investigated in any real way. So we've got to get much better at looking for those signs. And we've also got to get much better at not expecting the child to be able to tell on the first asking that something so serious that they're not even sure what it is that they can actually tell about it. It may be that there's several attempts at disclosure before they'll tell you the full information. In fact, one of the sessions I was in earlier where they were looking at um, why kids didn't disclose in childhood, and this is certainly from my own experience as well, both in my earlier career at PMH as well as subsequently, is that children often say something. They give a signal. They sort of almost test the water. They don't tell the full amount until they see what sort of response they're going to get. We've got to get much better at understanding that process. Not only that, but the, the impact is across the whole of life. And it's also across um, all of the domains. So physical, there's plenty of issues around physical health. I'm not going to go into the neurobiology and the neurophysiology of, of trauma and the, the impact on, on, on people's development because I think it's well described and probably someone can do a better job than me today. But we certainly know that it can have ramifications for physical health, people can end up with uh, chronic disease at a very early age, and we see that in the private sessions. So people in their 50s with multiple uh, system failures, um, particularly things like diabetes and chronic heart disease, also major mental health problems, depression, PTSD, all of those sorts of things. So physical health can be affected. Psychologically, of course, we know that you can have the full gamut of psychiatric disorders, um, as well as a whole pile of other sort of interpersonal and difficult issues with uh, coping styles and the like. In terms of the psychological issues, most people we see have some form of post-traumatic stress symptomatology. And the two that seem to be the most common are the intrusive imagery and the hypervigilance, both of which are extremely difficult to treat when they become very entrenched. And it's the one thing that causes, particularly the intrusive imagery, causes immense distress over time. The other thing that we're also seeing um, in the private sessions is the episodic nature of some of these symptoms as well. So people may have had really good treatment, they may be doing quite well, 
and then something else will trigger later in life, maybe a life event, um, maybe it's age, and everything comes flooding back again. So I'm not sure that in the whole area of treatment of PTSD and the like that we've really got to a point where we can say that anyone is safe uh, from these things in the future because they're not. We also see that in the ageing population, the intrusive memories are definitely much, much stronger, particularly uh, for people who start to become um, cognitively impaired. They have less defences in being able to protect themselves from the intrusive imagery and the feelings and the memories, and those things become much more prominent. And I wonder whether, in fact, in our aged care services, we understand the impact of early childhood trauma, particularly if it's been undisclosed, in later life. But it's certainly yeah, a problem. Even people who have had very good treatment, very good care, and who have been reasonably functional in their lives, the one universal thing that everyone has told us is it never goes away. You, you can't forget, and it's always there with you throughout your life. Some of the other impacts socially, of course, um, are the fact that people have enormous difficulties in forming trusting relationships. They often don't trust in authority, which makes it difficult for them to access services when they need it. Um, but it also makes it very difficult in their interpersonal relationships. One of the biggest issues, of course, as you can imagine, is, is, that, um, is the difficulty in forming intimate relationships, which often leads to family breakdown and problems with their partners. And of course, if people are unable to disclose to their partners, then the partner is not knowing why there's these difficulties between them. We've also had cases where uh, people have disclosed to their partners and that's actually resulted in a negative experience um, and in fact has worsened the relationship. In other cases, it's the partner has said, oh, now I understand, and it's made all the difference in terms of moving on into a more positive relationship. There's also spiritual and cultural aspects um, to the abuse as well, and for some uh, children who grew up in uh, the faith-based organisations or were very heavily uh, church-based in terms of their families. Um, the, the loss of faith for those people has been a major impact on their life. And that sense of existential despair that they get when they're older, what do they believe in? What, what faith is there? And uh, same with the cultural issues. One of the other uh, issues that's become, um, I think, interesting from my perspective as a clinician is this understanding of suicidality. Currently, if we look at the sort of evidence base around suicide, we don't tend to think that young children have intent in regard to death because they don't understand the permanency of death and all of those sorts of things. But what we're actually hearing in the private sessions, and these are, this, of course, is a retrospective history, but what we're hearing in the private sessions is a number of people having attempted serious suicide, wanting to die at a very young age. Um, and multiple attempts at that. Um, so that, that feeling of absolute despair for children uh, is definitely something that uh, we probably need to find, a little bit, find out about a little bit more and the way that then uh, entrenches those, that suicidal behaviour. The other issue that's become very evident as well is at the end of life. A lot of people have said to us they will not go back into care. They cannot go back into care and they do not see that as an option for them. Um, so the issue of suicidality in that age group, as people do age and become unwell and do need to go into an aged care facility, will be problematic, particularly for those people who are in the large orphanages as children. And I'm not sure we've quite grappled with that and how we support people well enough in their homes. A lot of the people that we've seen, and particularly given that we're seeing a large cohort of, of, of older men, they live very lonely and isolated lives. There's very few support services for them. Uh, so trying to actually find services that have some sort of meaning, uh, they're very disconnected from family. Sometimes they've made a decision not even to have children because of their experiences. Makes it very difficult to provide any meaningful service for them. Some of the other issues that we're seeing um, relate to the fear and shame and guilt as well as the sense of injustice that people have felt throughout their life. The fear can, can be from a variety of, of issues. Some, some people have experienced a lot of physical violence in the institutions as well as the sexual abuse. So there is just the, the fear of um, 
that, that, that's contained within a, a culture of fear within some of the institutions, which actually prevents them from reporting, but leaves them with lifelong fear as well about their own safety. The shame is a huge issue for both men and women, but I think probably more so for men. Um, and feelings of guilt as well, particularly when some of the experiences for children have been pleasurable. Um, they then feel that they must be at fault somehow because they've actually enjoyed part of the experience instead of understanding that some of that is probably just a physiological response. But that causes enormous guilt. It also causes enormous confusion in sexuality and sexual identity for adolescents. because They just don't know how to understand it or make sense of these experiences when they know it's abuse. Um, and the sense of injustice as well, uh, when they have tried to disclose and no one's actually given them a positive response. Fear can also be part of um, find, people finding out as well. So people are very fearful that someone might found, find out what's happened to them. They might then be the subject of bullying or harassment, or as I said before, the fear that someone might think that they're also an abuser. A lot of people still feel that there's a huge stigma in identifying either as a victim or, or as a survivor in today's society. Um, at the same time, a lot of men have also said to us that the Royal Commission has given them permission for the first time in their life to speak up, so it's a little bit of a double whammy. But I still think that there's that stigma in society in understanding people when they do come forward uh, with, a, with a disclosure. Fear can also be about some of the threats, and um, one of the interesting stories we had uh, came from a, a mother who had said to her children, if anyone touches you, I'll kill them. So of course the child didn't disclose for fear that the mother would be violent and end up in jail. So we also have to be very careful about the messages that we're giving to our children in terms of how we're protecting them. Um, but there's also been lots of threats and fear around um, their, their family safety um, if they don't uh, comply with the, with, the, with the abuse that's occurring. In terms of disclosure, I think we need to do a lot more work, and I was very interested in the session earlier that I went to today that looked at some of the issues related to why children don't disclose. And some of those issues, um, I don't know whether the, the woman is here from the UK who presented on that, but I thought it was a great, a great paper, and certainly fitted with exactly what we're seeing. People don't disclose because of fear, they don't disclose because of shame and guilt and blame, self-blame, they don't disclose because they didn't even know it was abuse at the time and they didn't work that out for many, many years. Sometimes they normalised it, um, and it wasn't until some sort of awakening much later in life that they understood it. So there's lots and lots of reasons why children don't disclose. In our, um, in our data, it's on average about 22 years before people disclose, and we've had some people not disclose for up to 70 years, 80 years. So there can be a long time gap between when the abuse occurs and when they actually finally talk about it. I always ask the question of people, what helped them to disclose or what were their issues around not disclosing and what would have helped them to disclose, you know, should they be, have been given an opportunity or, or whatever. Most people have said to us that if they'd actually had someone they thought they could confide in, that they could trust, that would actually believe them and that would actually do something for them in a helpful way rather than a punitive way, then they may well have disclosed. People have also said if they were asked directly, rather than perhaps, are you okay, you know, has something happened, maybe something a little bit more explicit than they may have disclosed. But <clears throat> there are a group of men who seem to be increasing in numbers the more private sessions I do, that have said it doesn't matter who asked or what was offered, I would not have disclosed. I don't know how we get around that. Because while they're not disclosing, they're not getting access to treatment, they're not getting access to recovery or healing. But for some men, it's not until they reach a certain age before they felt that they had the confidence in themselves or for whatever other reason developmentally that they could finally talk about what had happened. So I think we need to do a little bit more work in that area because clearly for those men, when they sometimes do disclose in their 50s, it ends up leading to a major breakdown they sometimes then can't work, and there's a huge amount of devastation that then occurs following that. And I think that's really sad um, for that to happen like that. For those kids who did disclose, many of them were beaten um, or punished, told they were lying, um, 
And so for, for some of those kids, they didn't then talk about it again. Um, and sometimes they didn't talk about it again for many, many, many years until they felt safe enough or that they were going to be believed. Let's talk about some, some slightly better stuff for a little bit. Some of the other things that we're also seeing in the sessions is the remarkable survival skills and resilience that people show and that, that children show. Um, in fact, some children are incredibly clever at the way they survive some of these experiences. For me, thinking about this in preparing for today, I was reflecting back on, on what people have told me helped them get through their life or helped them cope with whatever was happening to them. And it falls into these sorts of categories. A lot of kids still had hope. They thought that this was just going to be part of their life and that there was some sort of hope for the future. Um, along with hope, I think, also goes determination. A lot of kids were so determined that they were going to show uh, these people that had been either saying things to them or you know, abusing them in this way that they were OK and that they were going to make it and they weren't going to be beaten. So some kids had an incredible determination. But I think overall, the thing that seemed to have got most children through the more severe forms of abuse that we've been hearing about was some mastery, something that they had in themselves that they were good at. And that could have been they might have been clever at school, they might have been good at sport or music, and that was something that kept their sense of identity, their sense of self, some sort of sense of personal agency, was having something that they were good at throughout the period of abuse that kept them going throughout life. And I think we could probably do more work in that area as well in regard to helping children develop mastery. Because what trauma does is trauma traps children in a trauma story. They then don't achieve mastery over all of their developmental tasks over time. And they don't develop that ego strength or that personal agency as adults. And therefore those, those sorts of developmental interruptions keep occurring. So I think that's a really important um, aspect. Some of the other things that helped people get through um, was having at least one stable, positive relationship. And for some of the people who have done better in life subsequent as adults, having some kind of strong family relationship or some partner relationship that kept them in good stead uh, was vitally important. In terms of therapies, I think I've heard every possible therapy described so far during the sessions. Some of them a little bit on the strange side, but some of them are very mainstream. And what I've learnt, really, is that there is no one thing. There is no one path. Um, it's a very, very individual journey that people take. And you, I've had people say, this service was absolutely fantastic, and another person say that exactly the same service was awful. So we can't predict who's going to benefit from which therapy. However, what I can say is that what seems to be common for those therapies that have worked well is the goodness of fit with the person that they're seeing in terms of the therapeutic relationship. And I would probably have to say that over all my years as a clinician, as well as my work with the Royal Commission, the greatest strength that we have in helping people overcome adversity is the nature of the relationship, the strength of the relationship that we, de that we develop with people and the continuity over time. There's no point in people having to constantly tell their story over and over again to different agencies, to different workers. We've just done an out-of-home care hearing where uh, one of the issues for children in terms of their outcomes was if they had a stable placement and they had less workers. Um, if you're constantly turning over all the time and you have no sustainable relationships, you're not going to do so well. But certainly, um, for what we're seeing, that goodness of fit with a therapist, and a therapist who's going to see a person over a longer period of time, appears to be the most significant factor in their success. Okay. Um, just a couple of quotes. Every time I speak up, I feel stronger in myself and sure about what I'm doing and what I've achieved. It lessens the power they have over me. After 50 years, I finally feel I've been heard. People have listened to me before, but no one has really heard me. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that in regard to the, the, to the private sessions. It's a huge relief for people to come to us. We're now seeing a second wave of people coming. The first wave we saw were people who were already ready. They'd been advocating for the Royal Commission. They were ready to come and tell us their information. Now we're seeing this second wave. These are people often who have first disclosures. 
Um, so they're not, they're not, they're nowhere near along their emotional journey as the others. And the relief for them is enormous. The breaking the power of the secret is huge. The catharsis and the unburdening that they feel is enormous. They feel a sense of validation finally after many, many years of struggling in the wilderness. And I think being heard in the Royal Commission is very powerful. I never realised it would be, to tell you the truth. I thought, oh yeah, okay, you know, a bunch of lawyers, whatever. Um, but it's a very, very powerful authority. And not only that, but people aren't just coming for their benefit. They're coming to help other children. And I think that in itself is a very empowering process and something I think that's been very important for survivors coming to talk to us. Also, um, when they come to us um, and they understand the authority and power in the Royal Commission, if you tell them that what happened to them was a crime, that's incredibly relieving for them and they actually believe it for the first time. They've probably been told it by many other people, but they didn't actually believe it. But coming to such a powerful authority, they do believe it, and I think that's important too. I also think that people have an additional um, sense of empowerment when they give their evidence in the public hearings as well. It's like they've, they've faced their, um, their abusers, even if the person isn't there. Um, one of the other sessions that we had, uh, sorry, one of the other survivors that we had give his testimony in a public hearing uh, was a fellow um, when we did the near coal orphanage in uh, Rockhampton. And when he was asked at the end um, if, it, if there was anything else he'd like to say, he said to us uh, that the Royal Commission had helped him keep a promise to get my one day in court as I promised my mum. And his mum died shortly after that. Um, so that was very powerful for him to be able to tell his story in public. And I think the other thing about um, the outcomes for people is that um, we heard this morning about reconciliation being a moment um, in healing. This may be a moment for them in their healing journey, but it can be a very powerful moment. And for many people when we've done the follow-up, the follow-up has been overwhelmingly positive and it's been sustained over time. So it's not a moment that then falls away and there's uh, a, a decompensation. It's actually a moment that then appears to shift their life trajectory somewhat into a positive way. And I think that's fantastic. So redress is the next part um, that I just wanted to talk about briefly um, because it was partly related to the issue of reconciliation that we talked about this morning. We've identified, um, we, we have an issues paper out at the moment. We're going to publish our redress paper by the end of the year. It has three elements to it. Um, the direct personal response, which is the institution's response directly to, to the survivor, some form of financial payment, and then access to lifelong psychological care. Um, sorry. If we look at the direct personal response, the issue of an apology is quite a contentious issue and it remains a contentious issue. Some survivors have said they want one, some survivors say they're useless. However, what we've, what we've come to understand that if the apology is a proper acknowledgement, it recognises the harm from a personal perspective for that particular survivor, is heartfelt and delivered in a way that's meaningful, then it can be significant for that person and it can have a lot of, um, a lot of meaning. In terms of the financial payments, we've looked at, uh, sorry, also the direct personal response may also be other things that they want from the institution. There's been a lot of issues around memorials. Um, get-togethers for people who have been in a particular institution, as well as other sorts of things like the names of offenders being on the names of rooms and you know, clubs and things like that, and how we deal with uh, changing those sorts of things. In terms of the financial payment, that's been looked at as a matrix. Um, it's not considered compensation because it's not a civil litigation sort of court um, process. It's really part of a recognition that harm's been done and it goes some way to assist people financially. And the figures being looked at are around about 200,000 for a maximum payment, with an average payment obviously being much less than that and based on a matrix of what happened and the impact and other factors that may be relevant. The one thing that people have said to us though, which is absolutely vital, is the need to have access to lifelong psychological care. Um, not necessarily that people need it every day or every week or for the, for the whole of their life, but they often need it at times. When they need it, they need it. And one of the difficulties that we have in this area is that a lot of the access to services means that you have to have some kind of diagnosis or a mental health plan, um, which people don't necessarily want to be labelled with. So we've had to look at that in a very different way as to what's an appropriate psychological support for people and how we're going to make that available for them um, lifelong. Okay, I'm just going to quickly move on. 
Our end date is December 17. The work plan is extensive, but there's still room. If you know people or you know institutions that are worthy of a public hearing, we need to know about it soon, because at some point our roster is going to be full and we won't be able to include any additional institutions. We will finalise the redress and civil litigation recommendations this year. Um, and we'll also, because the commissions are going to be around for five years, we'll actually have a chance to go back to the institutions that we did early on, and instead of letting them off the hook, say, what have you done? Isn't that fantastic that a commission can actually do that? Usually commissions are so short, they don't get the chance to review anything. Whereas we actually get the chance to go back and say, well, you know, did you follow the recommendations? Did you implement them? Or what have you done? How have you changed? What have, how have you made your institution child safe? So I think that's fantastic. The one issue that remains um, unresolved, though, is do we need an ongoing authority? If there's going to be a lag, and for some people there will be, regardless of what opportunities we offer them to disclose, then who are they going to disclose to in years in, in, in years in the future? Do we need some sort of ongoing authority that's going to have responsibility and some sort of power to look at those stories and look at those disclosures and make sure that they get um, embedded or implemented into policy into the future? So a couple of reflections before we finish. I think... Um, I think trauma is like a thief in the night. It, it really robs children of their innocence and their freedom. It robs people of their joy and their ability to have peace. And unless we really understand and, and, and grapple with the full extent of what trauma does in childhood, we'll, we really will fail our children dismally. The other thing is we, we also know about some of the pathways to offending and we also know that for one of the risk factors for people uh, becoming offenders, particularly um, abusive uh, sexual uh, behaviour in adolescence, is domestic violence, being exposed to domestic violence. Have we fully incorporated our understanding of pathways to offending and put them into our prevention programs in childhood? I don't think we have. And not that we want people to feel like they're going to become perpetrators, because we would not want that. We don't want people to feel stigmatised. But there must be some learnings from those pathways that we can put earlier on. So instead of waiting for adolescents to start acting out in these abusive or inappropriate ways, we've already prevented it by those early intervention programs. I know that children coming into care through domestic violence programs sometimes don't really receive any psychological support. So are we failing to provide those early intervention points with the full body of knowledge and information that we have? And the second sort of reflection I suppose I wanted to make is around healing. Do we really understand um, fully what's required in terms of a healing process and do we, do we fully support that in terms of our services? It is very individual and there is no one size fits all. We really do need to have more flexible models, I believe. And if I just take one example from an Indigenous perspective, some of the healing ceremonies that the Indigenous communities do are very powerful. And I wonder sometimes where we forget about some of the symbolism and some of the other sorts of things which may give meaning back for people uh, rather than just looking at this therapeutic response. So I do wonder whether we fully understood what it's going to take for a much, um, much broader um, healing system, um, and, and maybe a healing system for the whole nation as well. So a safer future is what we want. Uh, we've got to balance, though, this vigilance, eternal vigilance around protecting children with allowing children the freedom to explore. We don't want to make kids scared of going to anywhere or scared of trusting anyone. That would be a disaster. At the same time, we've got to have good protective behaviours policies. We've got to get much better at recognising the early signs and intervening early and responding well. We have to have safe systems of care. We've got to understand and have compassion when people come to us with these sorts of issues. We've got to develop a better system of justice. We're still seeing only the tip of the iceberg in terms of what gets to prosecution, what gets convicted, and yet we have all of these victims and all of these offences down here. And we've got to have a system of culture and, um, and reform. We've got to make sure that the whole nation understands these are all of our children. There is no difference where they come from or who they are. They belong to all of us and they are our future. And I'll just finish on this, this last slide. Do you think we could stamp it out, child sexual abuse?
be wonderful. I'd love to be out of a job. Let's at least try and make the impossible a reality by doing the very best that we can and giving children who have had this experience the very best treatment and services that we can, having a shared vision across the whole nation about protecting children, both in our heart, our mind and our spirit. And maybe instead of hearing the tragic stories that we've been hearing, we could hear this story. Once upon a time, there was a special place where children were loved and safe to grow up as they should, happy, healthy, free to dream dreams and achieve brilliance. And there were all these people, family members, brothers, mothers, sisters, fathers, and there were all these people in society who were in the background just to make sure things went to plan. And wouldn't it be wonderful if that special place included Australia? Thanks.